money. You think you can win by investing smart, but what if the government can just change the rules of the game far into it? In a world of fiat money, that's exactly where we are. In today's episode, we're going to look at what you need to know, how you can protect yourself, even with the rules changing on a daily basis. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Create Your Own Life Show. I'm your host, Jeremy Ryan Slate, the CEO of Command Your Brand. We help to combat cancel culture by placing our clients in the right podcasts and new media. You can check us out over at www.commandyourbrand.com or head over to Amazon and grab my new best-selling book by the same name, Command Your Brand. Reminder, before we get into today's conversation, to comment and like this video, smash that subscribe button if you support liberty, freedom, and want to build a better future. Today, we're joined by a return guest to help us in all things financial, Bitcoin, and investing. Alexander Lores, welcome back, man. Great to be back, man. Excited to talk to you about what uh, what's going on and, and what you just mentioned. So for people that may not be familiar with you and, and what you do, man, give us a, a little introduction. Self-taught financial analyst, uh, been studying markets, Bitcoin since 2017, uh, excited to be doing uh, work with Pointsville. Uh, we're deeply building uh, on uh, digital assets, which we can get more into later. But uh, I've been exploring financial markets deeply, especially since 2021, when inflation started rocketing and some of the history of inflation in this country and the rest of the world. So some parallels and some insights I want to show, you know, people discussed, are we going to a recession or not? I'd like to shed some light on that. Well, I guess let's start there. Like, you know, when we're looking at the current financial scene, it's it's kind of an interesting situation, right? Like I, I was talking to my wife about this the other day, is, it, is if you look at it, you know, you have kind of government numbers reporting, you know, where unemployment is and all these different things. And, and they're a lot rosier than the situation actually is. But when I'm, when I'm talking to people on a ground level, you know, I'm hearing about construction businesses that should be busy this time of year, laying people off. I'm, I'm seeing, you know, vendors unable to, to make their bills and things like that. So like, I guess when we look at it, you know, what does our current financial scene actually look like? There's a few factors, good points you make. On the argument of, are we going to a recession or not? To me, it doesn't matter. Recession is just a technical term. Uh, your life and how it's affecting you as the average American uh, middle class, small business owner or employee or consumer, um, you really couldn't care less if we're using the R word or not, right? Um, technically, mm -hmm. there was a recession last year for two quarters, a pretty light one, uh, glossed over. It was light enough that you know enough economists agreed to change the definition, but that doesn't matter. Here's what's happening. Taking a broader view, since 1971, the United States went off the gold standard. They were the last country, we were the last country uh, on a commodity-based money. We've got a situation of free money, easy money, uh, soft money, as you want to call it, versus, let's say, gold or, you know, I'm a big fan of Bitcoin. Bitcoin's hard money, gold. Uh, you have to mine it. You have to spend a lot of resources to physically get it. Uh, it's physical. Uh, Bitcoin, similar digital process in an advanced civilization, as long as we have the Internet and these sort of things, Bitcoin works as hard money because it's got an exact supply you can't create more of it because you're having a bad day or you want to get some more votes, right? Uh, in the United mm -hmm. States, the government, Federal Reserve, if they decide that they want to create another trillion dollars to solve a problem, they can do that. Every other country in the world can do that. We can do that because our currency is the global standard and, you know, not we, our government can do that uh, because the, it'll take a lot longer to reap the, the pain uh, of doing so. If Kenya prints a bunch of money, uh, you know, it's going to hurt them on the world scene, right? So America has a bit of a, a crutch there in that we are the, the monetary standard. What's that, what, that, what that has done is forced Americans to become investors because when the government prints another trillion, three trillion, five trillion, excuse me, when the Federal Reserve prints that, the government spends that, uh, <laughs> they can create – if you or I want to spend $100,000, we have to go and make that money. We have to deliver goods and services. We're forced to create value, right? Uh, so when the government does that, our value gets cut in half in the last five years or so, give or take, you know, I'm not quoting exact averages, but our money's basically been cut in half. 
Uh, inflation has been a steady going thing for the last hundred years. It's been more serious since 1971, since the U.S. went off the gold standard. But it's been, ex you know, it got worse around 2008 when quantitative easing became a new policy. Government started just printing stimulus money, billions and trillions of dollars. And it got much worse in 2020 with, uh, you know, it really got out of control. So each of these actions have actually made inflation worse. We've started to really, for the first time since 2021, face the penalties of the United States government's irresponsible fiscal policies and the Federal Reserve's loose uh, monetary policies. It made it easier at first and much harder later. Now we're going through that. So whether you want to call it a recession or not, it doesn't matter. Americans are individually forced to become investors. You can't save money. Your money is going to cut. In, it, generally, it would have it would cut in half in about 20 years. Now it's four or five mm -hmm. years. So we're forced to either invest in the stock market, in real estate, in Bitcoin, uh, and all those things with investments comes greater risk. So things can crash. You you can get scammed. You can get rug pulled, as we say. You can have a bad investment. So you're on riskier ground and more of your attention is away from you probably have a day job or a business that you're spending 40 to 60 hours on. Now you got another spend another 10, 15 hours to educate yourself on investing. At least the, the good side effect is more Americans are educated on investing and probably a lot have been scammed and lost money. So they, they have a lot more education, a school of hard knocks, but education. Now, how does that affect businesses and the cycle of inflation? It's it's a vicious cycle because starting in 2020, this became even more obvious uh, and very clear to see. So small businesses already to some degree survive on a sm very small margin. Uh, a small business run by a brilliant executive, you know, with the right timing of the market uh, can do great. And many have, and there's millionaires out there. Many millionaires have been created which is not as valuable as what a millionaire was 20 years ago, but still that's great. Right. Um, but the average small business owner, brilliant or not, is already on a small margin. So it's mm -hmm. difficult to pay employees a living wage or get enough materials. And that gives a natural advantage to somebody who's got somebody, but a company, let's say, instead of you, you run a mom and pop diner, you're in tough. Uh, the way to beat that is of course, have a chain of 500 diners and then you can get your materials for cheaper so you can afford to pay your employees a little better so they can work for you and actually survive. Um, so it's a vicious cycle because if you're an employee for a small business, you're attracted to a larger company, which can also give you benefits like stocks, uh, right, which will help you beat inflation. Uh, so you're more incentivized to work for, you know, Publix or something down here for 25 years and you, you have a nice retirement set up. It's a lot riskier to work for a small business or become a part owner in one, you can make more money faster, but the odds are stacked against you. And your competitors are these large companies that have buying power. It's very smart of them. If, if you're a large company, yeah, you, you need to grow. You need to, how you get ahead of that game. Either, you know, you might invest in real estate, you might invest in your own manufacturing facility, or you might just have so many stores that you can buy paper or, you know, gasoline, things like that at, at a much lower price. So that makes it even harder on the small businesses that forces them to raise their prices or cut their employees or not raise their employees wages. So that's tough in the small business business. That's tough on the individual employee and it incentivizes larger companies. So companies like Amazon have grown massively while competitors have had a real tough time. And they're even forced to basically become essentially a franchisee of Amazon or a franchisee of, you know, Walmart or somebody, right? These small companies, uh, it's a bit easier. They, they have less, you know, room for growth, but they're a bit more stable if they're linking up with a large brand. So you have these huge mega networks. It's the same thing in news and media. Uh, essentially, it's it's forcing a sort of twisted version of capitalism, where the capitalism I love is is more on the, you know, you go to the market, you can get the best oranges for three dollars. Someone else comes at two fifty. You know, it, it's like. The best products wins. Um, it's it's tough out there. So it's tough on everybody. It's tough on the big companies too, but they're forced to basically grow. Um, well, they have a lot so more margin. They have a lot more margin to work with, right? Because if you, if you look at it, um, yeah. They and and even like you know smaller businesses like you know you mentioned Amazon like well there's a lot of those smart businesses that actually use Amazon AWS right so they're using yeah. Amazon servers to do a lot of their own work as well. So at the same time, right. like no matter what, Amazon's protected. Yeah, and, and so it also forces Amazon, if there is a great business, you're a small business and you're really kicking butt, 
you're worried about your longevity. Amazon's got all this cash. They're trying to cut down on their taxes. They have to buy businesses. So they're, they're going to buy, you know, they spent years buying all the, the, you know, to make Alexa, they brought, I don't know how many dozens of voiceover companies to try to win that field. Right. So you've got that vicious cycle and it drives prices higher because one small businesses either have to drive prices up to pay their workers or they go out of business. Uh, the workers, you know, uh, fight to get better wages or get better jobs so that they can afford the higher prices. And then Amazon or other companies are not going to go off on a roll about Amazon's evil. They are forced or they, they if they have a monopoly, even um, whether it's a technical monopoly or, or kind of a, basically a monopoly anyway, right, without being labeled as such, mm -hmm. they have the ability to raise prices. Then you have government saying we're going to jack up prices, you know, uh, taxes on big companies. They're going to they're going to, to roll that down to the consumer. So is the government's fault? Is the big company's fault? Really, it, it's kind of a machine that's rolling. Uh, but it all goes back to this idea of free money, soft money, um, and the government's also pressured in, the, in a democracy by the people. Like, hey, we're not working. We need money. You need to give it to us, right? So it, it's, it's basically a vicious cycle. But at the core of it, there's two things. It's money and education. So Bitcoin solves the problem partly. It's not the whole solution, but you need some sort of hard money. You need some sort of accountability. Because any candidate, the left-leaning candidates are more likely to, to focus on printing money for welfare needs. The right-wing candidates less or so. But still, if you're in office and you got that pressure, you, you know, look what happened with Trump, right? He, he oversaw some of the biggest money printing with, with a Democrat Congress. So it was very easy to get it pushed yeah, through. And right? he also let... Um Especially when we went into to the whole pandemic era, like he also let BlackRock do a whole bunch of investing yeah. uh, of government money because they, yeah. he, you know, they thought it was going to solve the situation. Yeah. So we get into the right and left thing. The Republican idea is let the free market correct itself, which is a fine idea. But you do get these behemoths that come out of it when you lessen regulation. I'm in favor of less regulations or at least very clear regulations. But you get the BlackRocks, you get the massive empires that were unregulated, uh, that you get the real estate fraud that happened from Reagan, you know, I, I like most of Reagan's policies, but but he really deregulated the real estate, and then you had these these wild, you know, the no the ninja loans, no income, no job, happening in two thousand seven, mm -hmm. that that two thousand six, two thousand five, that crashed the real estate scene. So there's got to be a balance somewhere. Uh, Bitcoin's a great balance because it's digital. Look, if we have World War Three and, and the apocalypse comes, Bitcoin's not going to fix that. We're all going to go off into the hills with our guns and our gold and silver, but. <laughs> Like if the internet does go down, Bitcoin does have a problem. There's ways you can run it on CB radio, but let's be honest, uh, it's internet money, right? So yeah. in advanced civilization where we want to transact globally, we, we're not going to shut off globalism, you know, tomorrow. Uh, and, and I don't think we're ever going to shut up. We're not going to shut off, you know, a bunch of things overnight. So Bitcoin acts as a solution in today's world as a computer network that is global. It's secure. It's low fees. It's not controlled by any government. It's proven the test of time and it's secure. So you have Bitcoin as 21 million is the most Bitcoin that's ever going to be created. Uh, it's capped. That's why it's hard money. Gold, you can create more gold, even go to other asteroids and mine the gold. It's just hard to do and it costs a lot of money. So it's kind of regulated from that. It costs a lot of resources. So up to 1971. Well, I want to get a... I want to get a little bit more into this in just a second, but I want to, before we get too far down the road on it, I want to go yeah. back to, to one of the things that I think is a really important point on, on, on what you're talking about, Alex. And it's, yeah. and, and this is just me, me talking about it as, as an employer and kind of watching the yeah. economy for the past three years. But if I look at it, um, you know, my, my price for an annual campaign of somebody to work with me, um, two years ago was, was $10,000 for the year. Um, yeah. Last year, we had to raise that same rate to $17,000 for the year. Yeah. Now, as we're going into to 2024, that same rate is going up in January again. It's now 20, almost $22,000 uh, for a year. Yeah. Because the big problem you run into as, as, as an employer right now is you have states, um, you know, led by California and New Jersey now saying like, okay, so this is our state minimum wage. And I remember, you know, back in, when I was in, in high school, man, it was like $6 and, yeah. and something cents minimum wage. And, and now in New Jersey, like you're expected as an employer to pay 15, 25. And there's, there's just some jobs that aren't worth that. And I, and I think we run into this situation of, 
businesses are trying to figure out how to be profitable, they're mandated to pl- to to pay a certain rate, which I think the 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 education problem with this is the 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 consumer or the or the, or the regular worker that's demanding that 15 25 an hour doesn't understand what that also does to the economy right because now if they have to be paid 15 25 an hour well now their 99 cent hamburger now costs $7 and you know who's going to buy the hamburger then nobody can pay them yeah. so that also yeah, creates this this vicious cycle yeah. of economics as well yeah so the the democrat prop, uh, solution to the problem is to to raise the minimum wage to pay the people more which drives up inflation more. The Republican solution is, is to not do that somehow, I guess, and um, hope the prices go back down is what it seems. Like I've seen going back into politics and, and I, I'm right of center. I mainly support Republicans, especially in the last few years, some of the actions of Democrats, but I see nothing but complaining about here's what the Democrats have done to ruin the economy. Great. What are you going to do to fix it? It's not an easy Yes. solution so and it's not politically popular because you you get votes by people liking you and hating the other guy not going here's the 17 point solution to solve everything people aren't going to read that they, they don't care um at the yes. end of the day it goes back to the money you don't fix the fact that it's free money soft money so raising the minimum wage like the problem is the money is less valuable <laughs> quickly right so government spending more money on fixing the problem and giving out more handouts to, to solve people's pain is going to increase inflation, uh, forcing businesses to, to pay living wages t- to people that are needed at jobs that frankly, a lot of these can be replaced by AI anyway, uh, and robotics. Um, I, I, I'm, I've been on a diet, uh, it's been going well, but last time I went to checkers, you know, they, they, they automated the, the checkout count, you know, where you order the food, it's a robot. I know they have the technology, there's startups out there, they can, they can flip burgers. They don't need a human being to do that. You could man. Well, I know uh, my, my one guilty pleasure is, is, uh, yeah. my one guilty pleasure is Taco Bell. And I know, um, yeah. you know, Taco Bell now you, you walk in and there is one person working there yeah. because you work in, you walk in, you go to the kiosk, you order what you need, yeah. you go over to the counter. And I'm going to be honest with you, the man, it's actually easier to order what I need from the kiosk because I can check all the boxes, yeah. different things I want. And then it's just written down in a piece of paper that gets printed out and nobody's messing it up. So at the same time, like yeah. the service is better. <laughs> yeah. So again, back to this problem, right? It's easier. So the government's going to do it's yes. easier. The people want what's easier, but it's easier to just raise the minimum wage. You can have relief for six months before the prices skyrocket and you're going to be asking for more money. Mm-hmm. But the end of the day, the thing that you can control is the value of the money. Uh, it's going to be some pain to get that process, but by holding, uh, reconnecting it to gold, uh, what makes more sense to me, holding Bitcoin as an asset and a way to stabilize the money and, and some way figuring out how to prevent uh, the government from just reckless fiscal spending. And, and you know, the central bank needs to either get replaced or needs to, to to not you know i mean from 2008 to 2021 we basically invited this inflation you call it a recession or not it doesn't matter if the economy is growing we had these workers they had negative wage growth for two years inflation was bigger yes. than wage growth for two years so you look at the graph of americans credit card debt it broke a trillion dollars people have been living off of credit cards for nine months so the economy looks good in many metrics because the American consumer is trained to spend, we're trained to free money exists. So we need that minimum wage so we can get iPads for our kids for Christmas. And, you know, the president wants us to get EVs. So we want them too. But, you know, it, it's all a free money think, right? It's all like, well, we need a well, let me Let me ask you this then. Yeah. Um, I guess like, like when do we get to that point when we have to put the brakes on and look at some some kind of you know uh, hard currency that we're based off of you know you know be it gold be it silver you know be it Bitcoin because I, I don't know if you've been following uh, what Mile has been doing in Argentina yeah. um, but they actually put out a video as we're recording this they put out a video this morning so it's the twenty first where he's talking about like hey it's it's going to be a little hard for a little while because we actually have to put some things in place and put a stopgap in here um, I don't know if Americans would want to stand for that but like what is that in your opinion what is that point look like or where do we have to get to before somebody puts some sort of hard currency in whether it's bitcoin or gold or silver or whatever it may be there's only two ways that that it happens and unfortunately the second is how it really happens the first way is enough educated people figure out we're going down a bad course and we change course like with what melee well 
it's been a disaster there for 20 years. So the other is that it gets so bad, so disastrous, people's lives are so ruined, they get angry enough and they break the old system. Democracy doesn't work without proper education. And the whole point of democracy is you should have enough smart people mm -hmm. that you can turn it around, which at least they did it without a revolution in Argentina, but they've had the world, you know, top five world's worst inflation for I think 20 years, right? Over a hundred percent per year. So we, it gets bad at seven, 10, 15% here, re regardless of how, how we track it, right? It get, you know, oil doubles in price. That's bad for everyone here. Imagine every asset doubling in price every single year for 15 years, every good, right? So that's Argentina. So it gets so bad wow. it breaks. You either starve to death or you have a revolution or you just like, you know, fire this guy. Hopefully, you, do, you know, so back to this, uh, it was correct for the Fed to, to painfully increase interest rates to, to basically break the economy and create a recession, whether it's it's not a very soft landing, it's technically a soft landing in their definition. That is the right thing to do and it sucks. So that so we are experiencing a very mild version of that. It's like paying down your debt, uh, which is something I've, mm. I've been involved in, right? Uh, we go, look, okay, we want to do this. We want to go travel. We'd like to do upgrades to the house. No, we actually have to cut down on some things. We have to cut down on the weekend and work harder and create some more goods and services and collect more value on that, pay down the debt. So there was a time in the US where the budget was balanced. You and I were, were, were alive. You had a Democrat yes. president, Bill Clinton, you had a Republican Congress. So they forced each other into action uh, through gridlock and various things. And they actually agreed upon things that were the greater good for the country fiscally, financially. So you either have to do that but right now, there's no solid plan from Republicans other than to complain. Kevin McCarthy made a few inches of progress, but it wasn't enough. And, and then you have, you know, the left and right are basically reacting to each other's extremes and, and essentially um, shouting in their own echo chambers with no concept of fixing the actual problem. The Republicans are at least talking about the problem correctly, that it is the problem. I don't see a solution and I don't think there is a solution, even if they have an earnest attempt to do it, unless you put in hard money, uh, some sort mm -hmm. of forcing America to, you know, if we want to spend more money, let's, let's make more goods that we sell the, the Chinese or the Europeans or whoever and collect some money like you, a normal yes. person or household has to do our business. There's some grants and stuff, but you generally have to make something to take money from people. So we have to increase our GDP, gross domestic product, uh, you know, it's it's not free money. Like as a child, a child could operate this who doesn't understand money, who's not educated. I just want things from my parents. They just give them to me. That's how our government operates and how we've been trained to operate as consumers uh, and Americans. And if we really want to face it, we have to break, beat the system by investing. You can invest in Bitcoin. You can invest in real estate. You can you either – it's basically a race to become a millionaire or a race to become essentially homeless. And you can go to California and, and get some welfare there, right? So those are your, your choices, yeah, I, I, right? I, I'm I'm laughing here about your your comparison though. Um, I, we have a, a two year old and a almost three year old and a, and a five year old. And my two year old is like she's very two right now. Um, so like when she wants something, like despite how inconceivable it is, impossible it is, or how it doesn't yeah. work, she's like, "But I want it," and I and yeah. I I really I that really hit home for me as as looking at the how the consumer looks at it at the moment. And I guess looking at that, then education really is the crux of the problem, right? Because, you know, the consumer doesn't understand the debt cycle. They don't understand inflation. They don't understand a lot of these things. And I guess, how do we attack that then? How do we attack that problem and, and kind of solve that problem of education so that, you know, we, because if, if people truly understood what their government was doing to them, there would be upheaval everywhere. But people yeah. don't understand it, right? Like there's a lack of knowledge. So, so we're, how do we handle that? If you appreciate the work that we do here and you want to support this show, the biggest way you can do that is by supporting the products that we know, use, and love and that I recommend for you here on the show. The first that I want to talk about is MyPillow, literally one of my favorite products. The MyPillow Classic is what I use every single night. It's handled a lot of my neck pain, a lot of my back pain. As you guys know, I've been a competitive power lifter. Since my early 20s, I've retired from that, but I still take pretty good care of myself, and I'm still pulling some heavy weights since I pulled 500 last week on deadlift. And uh, our favorite product from we travel is actually the MyPillow Travel Pillow, and it's one of the things that we actually give to absolutely everybody. 
It is a great product to fall asleep on. So if you want to go to MyPillow.com slash C-Y-O-L, they have some really great holiday deals over there. You can get up to 66% off of select products. Also, one of the biggest changes in my life over the years has been handling a lot of the parasites in my body. A number of years ago, I did a cleanse with uh, Dr. Jason Dean, and we removed these things called liver fluke from my body. They were actually eating my liver. It was kind of crazy. And every few months, I do either a parasite cleanse or his full moon detox that he's doing right now. So if you want to head over to bravetv.store slash C-Y-O-L and uh, grab some of his amazing products over there. I know he has a great holiday special going on right now as well. Support our sponsors. They help the show to continue and they help us to do what we're doing. And we could not do it without you. And you could do it just by uh, using the power of the purse and uh, supporting the products that we love. Thanks. I think there's three areas and you're familiar with all three and I'm not particularly, I'm more on the financial side, but there's education in how to study itself. Um, mm-hmm. I do want to say regarding public school teachers, they're, they're the most underrated, underpaid, underappreciated group of people. Um, it's also their fault. Um, so I'll give both sides of the coin there, right? Uh, the education system, uh, the educators themselves, at the end of the day, you're, you're responsible for your product, your job. If you're a marketer and you know, the marketing stats suck, it's your fault. It could be other factors, but if you don't fix it, it's your fault. If a child grows up stupid, can't read, uh, it's your fault. It's not because they have ADHD or, or, or anything else. Um, it is your fault. If the quarterback uh, throws five interceptions, they could have the crappiest receivers, crappiest offensive line. It's still your fault. It's your statistic. So um, Mm -hmm. education has to be more focused on delivering a student that knows the basics of what they're studying, knows the basics of English, of math, of reading and writing, Heck, Spanish too, fine. But you you have to know the basics uh, of reading and writing, mathematics, and some form of social skills. Um, the second part of education is education of what the government is. The problem is everybody on the left and the right aren't educating what government is, what a republic is, what a mm-hmm. democracy is, They're educating on their version of it, They're educating on their political party and their platform. It doesn't help to have a communist and, and, and you know, even, you know, unless you're studying about the different kinds of government. There's not much civics education. Mm-hmm. What is the basic function of government? What is the people's responsibility in a republic or a democracy? Uh, so study itself is lost. Government is lost. And then financial education, which really is getting a bit high level if you don't know how to read and write. But and mm-hmm. math is, is a foundation to, to economics. Again, it's politically manipulated. You have communist economics. You have some pretty decent you know, right-wing economics that stick to basics. But most of the economics is all about our form of economics and not just the basic laws and rules of economics and how money works and how exchange works. So these three areas need improvement, uh, whether the government handles it or whether the private sector handles it. Let's face it, it's a problem. It's not getting fixed. And so then you get a, an adult population of people that are educated, still a little bit of that two-year-old stuck in them when they want things now, now, now. <laughs> And the owner goes, hey, I don't got money to pay you. And the employee goes, well, I want it. And the government goes, we're going to fix it by printing more money and kicking the can down the road. Problem never gets solved. So then you have democracy where everyone has power or equal power, not quite equal power, because if you have a billion dollars, you can buy ads, right? So it's not really equal power in any case and never has been. But where you have the founding fathers, I think, were on the right track where they they at first only you know, obviously there, there's problems with not letting women and black people vote. That's wrong. But only 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 landowners could vote, which was interesting. It'd be similar today saying only people who own stocks can vote. Right. So people had a vested interest in the success mm-hmm. of the country. There are essentially investors in the country uh, were allowed to vote similar to how you can vote. I think Apple. that's really interesting, too, because because that also looks at like how elections currently work as well, right? If you look at how modern elections work, like people vote for who's going to give them the most stuff and the best stuff, and they'll probably yeah. actually never get the stuff anyway. And, yeah, and, and like, that right? ends up being right. right. So they're not educated. Uh, the candidates, frankly, aren't educated either properly. They probably don't understand the basic function of government, um, which a lot of Trump's critics criticized him, but I could, I could lay the same criticism at most people in government. 
then you have they're trying to get ahead mm-hmm. too. They're cheating on their stocks and insider trading and <laughs> to get ahead. <laughs> Because they probably underpaid in Congress too. But at the end of the day, um, you know, the so the basic function, what was right, what was wrong about that? Of course, they didn't include uh, a lot of people that wanted a vote, which which would have made more sense, right? Um, I think the founding fathers, they were smart. The moment, um, you, you know, the revolution happened, they should have enlisted all the blacks into the army and then franchise them as citizens immediately after. And they could have done handouts to all the business owners and to all the slaves. Uh, that would have mm-hmm. fixed it economically. And we wouldn't have 200 years of, of this conflict that's still not resolved, right? So now we're mm-hmm. – welfare is doling out trillions of dollars to people that are disenfranchised and, and it's making them worse and pushing them down further, right? So anyway, that's here nor there. It's not 1776. We can't turn back the clock. But what was right sure. about that system is the people that were voting – were forced well they were by by default they had to be educated there were probably some dummies but if you owned land and you had to run some sort of financial you know um financial requirement you know you were forced to be educated and, and to have some sort of success so you were essentially like a shareholder in america it, it was kind of like the quarterly vote at the apple like you at least own some shares you could vote so it's it's gone on correctly so to include everybody. I think everyone should be included, but the missing part was education. Democracy doesn't work without the education. So you have a bunch of uneducated voters, and, and truly the 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 landowners, so to speak, of then, which were kind of like the millionaires of then, didn't truly lose this, the power. They still influence it anyway. They just do it differently. They do it in a different. You know, Mark Zuckerberg buys a billion dollars of ads or whatever polling stations. Celebrities go out. They have a million followers. They're still they're basically just manipulating the people that didn't vote that now can vote, but you know, aren't educated. So at the end of the day, it wasn't a perfect system. Then it's not a perfect system. Now it's not going to be perfect, but you can make it better by educating people on the basics of government and the basics of finance. So they can truly understand without 20 years of pain, without Javier Mille being elected, when people are ready to starve to death or fight a revolution. And sometimes it does result in a bloody revolution to, to overthrow because the uneducated people at the end are still going to, in the end, blame the people in charge. They're going to blame the president of the United States for their problems. Trump was blamed for COVID. Yes. Biden was blamed for the economy. They both had a responsibility in it, but they were not certainly 100% of the responsibility or even 50%. So, you know, you can blame the political party in power and you can vote someone else and then two years you can hate him and, or her and <laughs> repeat the cycle. But we need to increase education on basic education government and on finance if you get those things people hopefully those two those two breaking points where either people decide and democratically elect or through a republic or through a committee or a memorandum whatever it doesn't matter enough people saying this has gone too far we need to change the direction the ship is going the wrong direction or failing that the direction we're headed it's going to break it's going to be continue to be so painful that it just flips you're going to have things like california voting republican because you know, there's been 300 murders last week, or I can't walk through all the poop. Like that's eventually going to happen. But if people were educated and enough proactive measures to solve the problem, instead of just complain about the problem, um, I think we could avoid that breaking point. We could avoid the, the, we're only acting because of this disaster. People tend to be comfortable with the situation until you have a disaster. And so- Mm -hmm. I try to educate people as much as I can and try to help through my work as an analyst, uh, being online as you are, pointing out situations and, and trying to guide people in the right direction. I have a small effect, but if there's millions of us, uh, we can change course. We can get better candidates or we can at least influence the candidates to not be ridiculous. Because right now, the, the people influence the candidates for the biggest handout, as you said. Even even the, the right-wing candidates, they're – they're very far off from the, the Reagan principles of, of sound fiscal management. Um, we're, we're not. I think that's a really important, yeah. that's a really important note too, because I think if you like, it, it's, it's interesting if you kind of look at, um, gosh, it's, it's, I guess describing it, it's, it's kind of more like a scale, if that makes sense. Like if you look yeah. at it, like you look at, take a, a let's take just a, a Republican from 2023, you know, yeah. if a Republican from 1984 looked at them, they'd be like, dear God, they're left. But yeah, if the you Democrat look at if you have a, looked at them. 
If a Democrat, right? But then even if, a if you take it back even go, further, oh, let's, you're spending too much money. <laughs> If you take that 1984 yeah. Republican and you have like, let's say a 1945 Republican look at him, they're like, dear yeah. God, they're left. Right. And it, it, so it's <laughs> like we do. The scale does continually keep sliding. And, and I and yeah. I think it is interesting when you get that perspective on it. Well, yeah. And look what John F. Kennedy did, uh, a Catholic, you know, pro-life, uh, pro-life Democrat, uh, lower taxes. Um, he wanted to boom the economy. Right. So. That was 1962, three, right? So, and of course he got hit, the stock market crashed, everyone freaked out like, whoa, you can't be doing this. This was a Democrat. And, and there's a couple, by a couple, there's like, I guess three or four uh, conservative Democrats left that are fiscal conservative. Uh, they have enough agreement within their party in terms of social initiatives, but um, you know, they have this concept that we shouldn't endlessly spend money. Like Joe Manchin, um, like the country would be worse off if we didn't cut off uh, the the Biden plan. Like there was another three or four trillion they were going to spend. It would have made it much worse. And he eventually mm-hmm. approved something that wasn't awful. Uh, I still think it was too much, but he forced forced some restraint. And having a gridlock Congress that can't get anything done is almost better than uh, pushing through trillions of dollars of, of wasteful initiatives. So, yeah, y- you know. An ineffective democracy, in my opinion, right now is almost a better solution and, and we need to work to educate people and the average person needs to get educated. And if we can't fix the teaching system, then then people are going to have to, just like they've, they've forced themselves to become investors, they should force themselves to get educated and, and guide the country in the right direction. When we get into so much pain that it's unbearable, it will break and things will change, but mm-hmm. they don't always change for the better. Uh Mm-hmm. They could change for the worst. Uh, dipping my foot into politics, which I tr- try not to, because I'm trying to just educate everybody that, that will listen. Both sides are in um, an echo chamber where on social media, yes. you know, extreme viewpoints are, are espoused. You have to make your opponent a demon to gain support for yourself as a political party. So, there's a lot of Democrats. Well, I think we really, even see it like yeah. we even see it within the parties as well, right? Yeah. Like, and I think I think because yeah. you look at we we it's you know we had the fracture between left and right, and then even yeah. within left and right, that's fractured. And you have yeah. you know yeah, like you yeah, the, 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 the Republican yeah. primary has been disgusting. Just like no matter yeah. who you look at. Yeah, and, and and you look at what you hear and really investigating what the candidates are saying, it goes deeper than that. A lot, a lot, a couple of candidates are just, you know, running a marketing campaign with, with nothing backing and a couple are running a terrible marketing campaign with some decent platform points. Right. Um, for example, DeSantis, I, I strongly support him as governor. I think um, his campaign is, is just a disaster. Um, he's attempted to, to, you know, anyway, it, we go deeper on that. We go into social issues, which which yeah. I think the Republicans have failed um, massively. They had a massive opportunity around 2022. Um, if you and I were running the RNC, we'd have 70% of the vote right now. Um, and it, it involves mm-hmm. about three or four major actions. But the, the most important is an actual financial plan that works for everybody. You, you don't need to just take one extreme side. Uh, and, and both sides have, have generally focused on raising a ton of money. And pandering to their 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 kind of core, who are going to vote for them anyway. So um, instead of some sort of solution that works the greater good for America, um, mm-hmm. I think it's possible a Democrat or a Republican could do that. I think the Democrats are still farther off. That's why I'm right of center. But uh, at the end of the day, it it's really like you have to solve the problem or it's going to break. So mm-hmm. Bitcoin is a solution that works for both sides. You can be a progressive and stretch many of your views, but you can still agree with a hard money standard. Because if you truly if you truly yes. care about the downtrodden, um, free money makes it worse. It separates the rich from the poor at a greater extent. If you're a Republican, you truly care about a basic economy where people can rise through initiative and pulling their own bootstraps. Hard money is better than free money. If you generally love America and are a patriot, whether left or right, you, you know, Bitcoin's not a threat to the dollar. It can make it harder. You can add hard money into your system. 
uh, it's many examples have been going over for many smart analysts. Uh, Javier Mille is looking at a similar solution. He's hinted at a Bitcoin solution. I'm sure he would if he could. We'll see El Salvador's done some amazing things, which I'm excited to do. I've been keeping it quiet, but my work with Pointsville, uh, it's actually been involving some of these national institutions and central banks, some of their solutions that can actually help people globally um, using Bitcoin, in fact, more as a computer network than, than a financial system. But fact is, hard money solves all these things and makes it easier or at least possible for, you know, you're going to have left-wing states, you're going to have right-wing states. That's not going to change. There's some politicians out there or campaigns that make it seem like you can just make the other half of the country disappear. It's just not going to happen. You have to be realistic. You have to compromise on some things and you're not going to like them. But if you can at least guide the country on a financial course that is better for the country and for the people, you win. That applies to America, obviously, and that mm -hmm. applies to every country. We do have advantages here in America, which despite all I've said, no matter how much we have, I still bet on America. Uh, I still with Warren Buffett, mm -hmm. says you, you always bet on America because our odds are better than Kenya, which I think is a great country, by the way, you know, uh, than, than South Africa, better than Nigeria, better than Europe. I mean, Europe is a mess. Um, you know, as much as, as the Southeast Asia, those countries are rapidly expanding financially. We're in much better shape. Um, you know, mm -hmm. Latin America, a lot of great things to say about them. We're in a fantastic shape. Canada is basically our Xerox copy up north where I'm proud to be born in. But, um, you know, we have a lot of things going for us and we can make the change here in America. So I would ask any American, get yourself more educated, put down your, your personal biases and political beliefs. You can keep them, but just put them down for a minute to get some more facts, to get educated and, and not by people that are pushing their own agenda, which is what most people are doing. Uh, I wouldn't take financial advice yes. from somebody in the middle of a political campaign because their actions are determined by what's going to get them more votes. Uh, it just, it's very, no, no matter how great a person you are, how much you, you care in your heart, uh, you're going to be guided by other incentives. Look at yeah. Elizabeth Warren, who, who was elected as a so-called progressive for the rights of the small people and the small businesses and the individuals who is basically working for JP Morgan Chase right now, who literally first thing she did in office was call for huge fines in Wells Fargo is now basically on her knees supporting JP Morgan Chase, the biggest bank. And even outwardly saying, I don't usually agree with CEOs and big banks, but I do when it comes to crushing Bitcoin. And, and you know, she says it in her own way, but she's literally on a mission to, to clamp down on the corruption of the little person. Corruption in quotes, right? Like, sure, there's people doing stuff, but uh, there's no effort to crack down on big corporations, to to increase the, the burden on society on, on these massive free money, billion dollar, trillion dollar corporations. It's targeted at freedom. It's targeted at individual rights. It's targeted about the right of property. Uh, So-called progressive, who's acting more like a fascist, um, you know, extremist 1990s Republican who wants to just clamp down on little businesses and little guys. It's anti-capitalism and it's totalitarian. So I'll say one thing to the average American, if you're left wing and you think that Republicans can go all totalitarian on abortion and other social views, you got a point. If you're a Republican and you think Democrats are going to go totalitarian on, on vaccines and mandates and taxes, you got a point. If either party was in complete control, that's probably the direction they'd be going. So give them less power, educate yourself. And, and if enough of us do that, we could actually go back to forcing them to, to some esoteric things like good policy ideas. <laughs> you know, something that existed to some greater degree in the 90s and early 2000s. At least there was some concept of that. So um, mm -hmm. until then, we have to continue to force ourselves to be better investors. But hard money solves it to a good degree. It, yes. it doesn't solve it all the way. It makes it easier to solve. So I would encourage the U.S. going to print all that free money, buy up some Bitcoin, hold it. If there's some way we can cut spending tie it to an actual asset, a commodity. Maybe they need to tie, I just came up with this idea now, tie, tie the spending to the GDP. It has to be a certain percentage. Mm -hmm. You can't go above that. You cannot spend more money. I do not care. We have to say no. There has to be a period where 
We can't get that candy bar that we want. We can't buy that extra Tesla. We can't, you know, or, or Ford or GM or whatever. We can't go on that fifth vacation uh, as a country. That's how we, we need to apply fiscal policy to ourselves as families and individuals. But as a country, do we want to spend a trillion dollars on an ally in some other country? Yes. Not even saying it's a bad thing. I'll let them have it. I'm more libertarian leaning. But if you want to do that, fine. Where's the money coming from? In a business, if yes. I come to you in your business and say, I want to work for you, give me $30,000, you're going to say, A, what are you going to give me? Either what? Do you, what? where's the money? Is the money coming back? Do you, do I have that money somewhere? Are you telling me I have it, you know, sitting in an account for marketing? Like you wouldn't just give me money and I'd say, you know, it's going to be great for you, man. Trust me. It's good, <laughs> you know, or, or sell you on some some idea of how helping me is going to make you feel better about yourself. It, it's, it's like the yeah. government's running a fundraising campaign for charity or, or for for war. Not even saying those things have to be fully cut. I don't think they can be cut out fully. You, you can't. DeSantis is like, I'm going to shut down the FBI or something or the IRS. That's great. Yeah, there's a million employees over there. What are you going to do with a million unemployed people? Have you figured that part out? Or Vivek's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fire every government employee with an odd number. Okay, well, you're going to fire some great ones and shitty ones. You're not going to do any evaluation to figure out who's good and who's bad. At least fire the bad ones. Uh, so the government, you don't want a big government, but the government is so big. There's 3 million U.S. government employees or something like that. You can't just shut it off. If it mm -hmm. was 1950, yeah, we could say we're actually going to do away with the FBI. Sure, we'll, we'll put everything in just – Turn it down to local police, give them the authority to talk to each other. But but it's it's too you could cut it down five percent a year, you could trim it, but you can't turn off the switch anymore. It's not gonna work. Yeah. That would create a breaking point bad enough that would probably overthrow the government or, or you get voted out of office, right? So there's certain things yeah. you, you well, can't, well Alex Yeah, we're out of time probably, but that's it. That. No, I just I just was re just to rewind it down here. You mentioned yeah. um, you know what you're doing at, at points at Pointsville. So tell us a little bit about you know what you guys are doing over there, and also you know where we can find you and then where we can find out more about that. Great. Well, I used to talk on Twitter, Alexander underscore Loris, my name, where uh, you can hear me rant in more detail. You can DM me. We could talk talk even longer. But um, if you're not following Jeremy's show, which you should, everybody, uh, there's a lot of great guests who know more than me. But I will tell you this. Uh, I'm excited with Pointsville because I want to fix some of these things. Pointsville, I'm the marketing lead at Pointsville. Uh, that name sounds like something else. We are the number one loyalty provider for Major League Baseball. And we also work with some of the largest financial networks in the world, both in the decentralized and the centralized area. Some of the stuff is on you know, non-disclosure agreements. I can't talk about it. But what I can say is this. We're building solutions that are going to help a lot of people uh, – Connecting real world, real world assets like uh, you know a lot of the markets out there. There's gold. Uh, there's things that have value, uh, commodities like energy, right? And connect them to the Bitcoin blockchain, essentially, right? Uh, think of the value and the quick transaction times. Uh, no barriers. No. Um, you know, you can do it at Sunday at two o'clock. You can send someone money. Think of that and the benefits of crypto without all the scams and the invented tokens and the invented value, but connecting real world assets to uh, a blockchain seamlessly and securely. So we're building that for some of the largest financial networks in the world. Um, we're making it possible for uh, one country, uh, tens of thousands of women entrepreneurs are going to be able to get micro uh, loans to start businesses. Uh, thanks to a specific financial product uh, that's been created. So we're building solutions like that, essentially alternative asset solutions. Talk about investing, we're forced, people are forced into investing. A lot of people are looking to alternative assets. That includes Bitcoin. That includes uh, many other things like art, collectibles. Uh, think of us as an alternative asset factory. I'm excited to be their marketing lead. A lot more news I'll be able to share in quarter two. You can follow them at Pointsville app uh, on Twitter as well. So that's what I'm doing. I really appreciate the time, Jeremy, and uh, letting letting me rant here, talk about a few things. Absolutely. Well, uh, Alexander Loris, thank you so much for coming back on today, man. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And for those of you listening out there, reminder, if you have not 
like this episode, hit a like on it, leave us a comment, smash that subscribe button if you support Liberty and you want to help us make a bigger message. Thank you so much for hanging out, everybody, and I'll catch you guys next time.